Hello! Welcome to Sleep Money, your guide to the business and finance and economics of the entire planet. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Elizabeth Spires of New York Times and Sleep and places like that. Hello. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hi, hello. And I am so thrilled to be able to be here with Henry Farrell. Henry, welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Henry, who are you? Introduce yourself and plug your book. So I am a professor at Johns Hopkins. I have a ridiculously overcomplicated title for the professorship. Uh, and I have a book which is co-authored with Abe Newman called Underground Empire, How America Weaponized the World Economy, which tells you about the ways in which semiconductors, the financial system, the internet have all become arenas in which the U.S. has sought to dominate, has sought to coerce other countries, and now other countries are looking to push back. And so we explain the politics of how that works. This is one of the most eye-opening books I've read in years. It is full of juicy anecdotes, and we're going to scratch the surface of it in this podcast. We're going to talk about SWIFT, the, the money system. We're going to talk about Huawei. We're going to talk about Binance. We're going to talk about the EU and China. We're going to talk about Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and basically just looking at it all through this lens of geopolitical power and weaponization. We're going to talk about Citibank. This is honestly an amazing episode. Henry, thanks so much for doing this. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Charles Schwab. Schwab believes every investor deserves to work with a firm they can count on. That's why Schwab has 400 local branches with financial consultants ready to serve you, along with professional answers and 24-7 live help. And it's backed by Schwab's satisfaction guarantee. If you're not completely satisfied, Schwab will reimburse eligible fees related to your concern. Visit schwab.com slash satisfaction to learn what's included and how it works. Charles Schwab, own your tomorrow. This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. Henry, your book came out before Henry Kissinger died. But we, we, we are recording after Henry Kissinger died, so we can talk about this. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Henry Kissinger dying, if I can put it that way, is the the wonderful editors of Jacobin magazine, it turns out, have not only written, but already printed a book to be um, released upon his death. And in the introduction to that book, what they write is this thing, which I wanted to like kick off this podcast with, because it, I think it kind of gives a, sets the stage a little bit for all of the things we're going to talk about. They say, the world Kissinger wrought is the one we live in today where ideal investment conditions are generated from the barrel of a gun. Today, global capitalism and U.S. hegemony are underwritten by the most powerful military ever devised. And it strikes me that your book is basically updating that for the 21st century. And instead of using guns, we're using like InfoSec. I think that's right. And uh, there's also a kind of an origin story for my part of the book, which is co-authored with Abe Newman. And uh, Abe, I'm sure, has his own origin story. But the, when I began to start thinking about this was in a really, really unpleasant fight that I had with David Graeber, the author of Debt, uh, where we ran a seminar on debt at Crooked Timber, which is a uh, blog that I'm involved in. The greatest blog on the internet, I should say. It, it, is a big, it has been going for a long, long time, I think uh, a couple of decades at this point, which is a little bit terrifying to think about. But more or less what happened was that Graeber 
was a, a subject of a special seminar that we ran. And I was one of the uh, contributors to that seminar. And I wrote a thing which he really took strong exception to. More or less what I said was that uh, he had described the world as being a tribute system to the United States, which was all uh, about how the power flowed from the barrel of the gun. And I said that 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 wasn't the way that it worked, that the US military was very powerful, but that the threat of military invasion simply wasn't enough to explain why it was that the world system of the economy worked the way that it did. And so we had an extremely unpleasant fight where Graeber called me all sorts of things, dishonest, that this, that, and the other. It was uh, not very nice. But in fairness to Graeber, uh, one of the uh, results of that was that I began to think, okay, if uh, the world that we're in, where clearly economic coercion and US power is very, very important, if this does not flow from the barrel of the gun, then what does it flow from? And then uh, about a decade after that, uh, nearly, uh, Abe and I were writing, we were thinking about the uh, SWIFT network, and it began to come to me uh, that this was, in fact, one of the major sources of U.S. power. Was this a system of dollar clearing? Was this system of a financial exchange? And how it is that this really had become the uh, way in which the United States managed to coerce uh, large parts of the rest of the world to comply with U.S. laws, to uh, try and do whatever it is that the U.S. wanted them to do. So, so the, the SWIFT thing is, I would love to start with SWIFT, because we've talked about SWIFT on and off on this show for many, many years, um, but never in this context. SWIFT for, you know, is, is something that we come across like every so often if we want to make an international wire transfer, like the bank will have a SWIFT code. And you're like, okay, it's just like a communications messaging system between banks so they can send money to each other. And technically, it is a nonprofit based in Belgium. And if anyone you would think could go about their business sending messages around the world without suffering interference from the National Security Agency or the US government. It would be a nonprofit based in Belgium. And yet you have a fantastic chapter in your book basically saying, uh, you, you can tell me exactly what it was, but it wasn't all that long ago. The the US just woke up one morning and, and said, you know that thing about you're never going to give us any of your information? Well, never mind that. You're going to give us all of your information. And they said, okay, then. So, yes. And I think that this was uh, the other part of the origins of this book. This is really Abe's part, was that we had written a book which was about Europe and U.S. fighting over privacy. And SWIFT plays a very, very important role in that. And so Abe had thought, there's something important here that nobody pays attention to. Because SWIFT is such an incredibly boring-seeming organization, the stuff that it does just seems excruciatingly dull. It really is the plumbing of the international financial system. So then you begin to wonder, why is it? that you have this big fight happening between Europe and the US. And Abe said, we ought to do something on this. And so this is the second part, as I say, of uh, how this came together, was Abe's attention to that. Really, the story of SWIFT is that it's a Belgian cooperative, as you say. Uh, it is doing this excruciatingly boring work, and it has used its boringness as a shield against the US government for decades. So at a certain point, Mueller, of the famous Mueller inquiry against Trump, comes to uh, uh, Swift when he is uh, in charge of the FBI, and he more or less says, give us uh, all of the information you have. And Swift refuse. And Swift, I think, have the tacit backing of the US Department of Treasury, which does not want the international financial system to be messed up by uh, US law enforcement or US intelligence and its demands. But then post September 11th, there's a sudden striking change. Treasury changes from being the protector of the global financial system into being one of the actors which says, let's figure out how to take this vast unruly system that has been created and let's turn it into a means for the United States to pursue its adversaries who have wrought this uh, horrific blow against the United States on September 11th, 2001. And suddenly all of these aspects of the global economy, which appear to be dull, which appear to be boring, which appear to be no more than plumbing, these the plumbing becomes political. The plumbing becomes a means through which the United States can begin to tap into all of these financial infrastructures and figure out what people are doing, 
what people are sending to each other, what what ways the money is flowing. And then gradually the United States begins to experiment in ways of turning this. And here I think SWIFT is important, but the dollar clearing system is probably more important, begins to experiment with ways of turning this into a tool of coercion. Yeah. And to tie it back to what you started off by saying, it, the United States goes from enforcing its will through the barrel of a gun to enforcing its will through the the dollar. That's that's the whole thing. It goes from one kind of violence to economic violence. I feel like this became most clear with what the United States did after Russia invaded Ukraine. But as you lay out, it's something that's been going on through trial and error. What, what do you say? You say in the book something like, let's see what this button does, is how <laughs> the U.S. kind of tested this out and saw and, and, and found the limits. And so far, it doesn't seem like there are limits to the, the way it can wield the power of the dollar around the world. Although there are. I mean, this is one of the interesting things. I remember in March 2022, after Russia invaded Ukraine, and there was talk about cutting Russia off from SWIFT, a lot of people talked about that as, quote, verbatim, the nuclear option. This was going to be the thing that basically caused the entire Russian economy to implode because they wouldn't be able to import anything or export anything. And it was it, it was so potentially devastating to Russia that we were worried that even like invading Ukraine might not be a bad enough thing to justify such an act. And then we did it, and the Russian economy broadly kept on plugging along you know it was not great before and it's not great now but we didn't there was nothing sort of nuclear about it and um henry your um crooked timber colleague dan davies wrote a piece saying plumbing is not architecture and that ultimately swift is plumbing and you can reroute plumbing so i think that uh, there are a couple of things going on here so i think that on the one hand, uh, the U.S. has really been able to exercise some extraordinary power throughout this. And the counterexample here is, of course, Iran, where the uh, combination of uh, cutting it off from SWIFT, but uh, more important, cutting off Iranian banks from uh, dollar clearing, they got rid of this roundabout way through which uh, Iranian banks could uh, touch the U.S. Uh, financial system for the microsecond that was necessary to make uh, transactions in dollars. Uh, so you saw there, this really did bring Iran to the negotiating table. But I think that there are, there are, as you say, there are some quite important limits to power. And a lot of the conversation that we see happening in the op-ed pages really focuses on the question of whether U.S. dollar dominance is going to disappear, with the implicit assumption being that it is going to be replaced by a different currency. I don't think that's going to happen. I think if you see things happening, it'll be more like the kinds of things that Dan uh, suggests, that you will see nibbling around the edges, that you will see all of these informal dark spaces beginning to uh, spring up in the global economy. And we have seen that happen to some degree with respect to Iran, and certainly also with respect to Russia. And uh, here we have seen various countries such as uh, Turkey being willing implicitly to serve as a kind of a cutout through which all sorts of sketchy uh, transactions actually flow. Uh, but uh, this does not mean that the US dollar is going to disappear. The second way in which uh, we have seen these uh, weapons becoming turning out to be less important or less of sort of devastating than uh, we thought is that, uh, as you say, their consequences for the economy, they turn out, you know, they turn out to be substantial, but they do not turn out to have that immediate devastating impact that people thought that they would have. So there's been a very, very interesting change in rhetoric in the last couple of months coming from the Biden administration. At the beginning, you saw to some extent from Biden officials, I think more from European officials, the sense of, uh, oh my God, this is a devastating thing, a kind of an Oppenheimer moment where uh, we have become like gods. Look at the majesty of the power that we are wielding against Russia to a, well, actually that probably isn't going to happen. But instead, what we are seeing, we are effectively putting sand into the gears of the Russian economy, which is grinding slower and slower and less effectively. So this in a certain sense, is uh, useful if you want to try and degrade the ability of an adversary over the longer term to do bad things. Certainly, if you're trying to get Russia to make major concessions in its war against Ukraine, this probably is not going to be uh, what you wanted to do. 
Right. But the, the of course, the other thing that happened after your book was published is this massive criminal settlement that the United States did with Binance, um, which just happened a few weeks ago. And you have a completely compelling theory that the United States could easily have shut Binance down and deliberately did not, precisely so that they would be able to get in there and put their little NSA mirrors in there and all the rest of it and get complete visibility and sort of infosec on the one, you know, large part of the sort of unregulated global economy and bring that into the sort of American panopticon. Yes, that's right. That is exactly our theory as to what Binance is. And the underlying argument of this is that if you want to try and exercise coercion, this is really, I think, one of the main themes of the book, you want to have big centralized points of exchange that you can seize and that you can use and turn to your own purposes as a government. And so Binance, in a sense, provides this uh, entry point for the United States into the uh, entire crypto economy. Binance is a exchange where you can, more or less, you can exchange one cryptocurrency for another. It plays a very, very central role in the crypto economy. And now Binance is obliged to implement all of these uh, bureaucratic means to uh, make sure that its customers are who they are supposed to be, to monitor what kinds of things their customers are sending to each other, and to do this all under the aegis of an external actor, an external monitor, who has the ability to squeal to the US government if Binance is not behaving in the ways that it ought to behave. And again, in a sense, this is really weaponizing the boring aspect aspects of the world economy, because there is nothing duller than know your customer uh, routines. There is nothing duller than all of the bureaucracies that major financial institutions have to install if they want to uh, be able to act as part of the regular global financial economy. This is not a uh, thrill a minute stuff. But once you get this bureaucracy installed, it becomes a self-perpetuating thing. And it also becomes a kind of virus, because then Binance, if it wants to make sure that it is keeping its nose clean, it is going to want to make sure that its major interlocutors, the other actors who it does business with, that they also have know your customer type institutions set up. And it begins to spread, as uh, two sociologists have uh, described, it begins to spread as a virus uh, through the uh, financial system. Uh, this is what happened to the uh, regular financial system over the uh, course of the 2000s. And this is probably going to happen to crypto as well. There are bits and pieces of the crypto economy that are trying to in insulate themselves from this. Uh, there's a famous saga with Tornado Cash, which is a cryptocurrency mixer, but it is going to be very, very hard to do this and to maintain yourself as, uh, as a significant entity that is handling substantial amounts of money. I love the idea that we have moved from a world where power is exercised through the barrel of a gun to a world where power is exercised through like footnote seven on a KYC form. That's exactly right. And one of the uh, best quotes I think we have in the book is from Kevin Wolf, who used to run another extremely boring part of the US government, which is the part of the Department of Commerce that uh, implements export control uh, regulations. And he describes how there's this little footnote, I'm sort of in a uh, regulation that the Trump administration uh, administers, which uh, implements this new twist on export controls, which implicates trillions of dollars, you know, sort of literally you have this uh, thing in eight point type buried in this uh, really, really impossible to read for anybody who is not a trade lawyer document, which fundamentally reshapes uh, US power. And it all emanates from this tiny little eight point footnote. Slate Money is sponsored this week by GiveWell. It's the end of the year. This is a great time to donate money. Remember that donations to 501c3s like GiveWell are tax deductible. And they can be large. They should be large. We should be generous this time of year. But when you spend a lot of money, when you're making a big purchase, you want to make sure that you're making the right choice. You can listen to the marketing from the mattress sellers or the car sellers. Or what you can try and do is try and find an independent resource that's rigorous and trustworthy. GiveWell is that kind of resource for donations. They aren't a charity themselves so much as they're a pass-through vehicle. They will take your money and they will pass it directly, 100% of it, to the charities that are the most effective and that need the money the most right now. For more than 15 years, GiveWell has researched charitable organizations 
in incredible depth and it directs funding to just a tiny number of the highest impact opportunities that they've found in the world. Over a hundred thousand donors have used GiveWell to donate more than one billion dollars. That has probably saved over 150,000 lives and improved the lives of millions on top of that. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. And if you've never donated through GiveWell before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year. So act fast or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick podcast and enter Slate Money at checkout. Make sure they know you heard about GiveWell from Slate Money to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved only for a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. You mentioned the the Trump administration, and I think that's one of the more interesting parts of the book is sort of how the Trump administration broke all these barriers in terms of wielding the power of the dollar, especially around what it did with Huawei. And there's this connection between the actions that the Trump administration took against Huawei, the big Chinese telecom, that runs through HSBC, a big bank, and how those two are sort of interconnected And it's sort of this like wonderful illustration of just how obscure all of this is, but how it can change everything. And the final like kicker for me was that Trump did all this stuff and everyone was kind of like outraged about it, nervous about it, but it all kind of worked. Huawei's power was completely wiped out um, and its ambitions completely curtailed. Um, And then when Biden comes in, the Biden administration comes in, they kind of like pick up where Trump left off. In other words, like, he was criticized for doing all this stuff, but now this is this is U.S. foreign policy how it works now because of his administration. Is there any like red versus blue politics in this book? It just seems like it's like United States wanting power, where, no matter who's in the the White House. So there are important changes, but I think one of the major themes of the book is really that so much of this is people stumbling along, trying to figure out how the hell do they deal with whatever the latest crisis is, and grabbing whatever means come to hand. And very often those means have been provided by a previous administration or a previous set of officials who thought that they were pushing the envelope as far as it could be pushed. And then this suddenly becomes, you know, so the, the, the ceiling of the previous ambitions become the floor for what happens next. And one of the uh, reviews that I was personally a little bit annoyed. Uh, the Financial Times reviewed this book as saying that this was a vast and elaborate plot by the United States. And it's anything <laughs> but a vast and elaborate plot. Our argument is that really this is uh, just the United States and officials who seem from the outside to be incredibly powerful, and they are incredibly powerful. The United States looks like this vast monolith of power, but inside it's a relatively small number of harassed and overworked people who are dealing with these uh, crises happening again and again and again, and figuring out how do they do what they need to do in order to solve this. You know, another recurring theme of the book is that, you know, a lot of these exertions of power don't get a lot of scrutiny because they're embedded into systems that are very boring and people don't think of as systems that can be leveraged for power. At one point, you mentioned the government using LinkedIn, for example, as a site of information. Do you think that some of the ability of these systems to to function the way that the government has utilized them, whether they're being intentional about it or not, is coming from a place of no one really realizing that these things are being weaponized the way that they are and not getting the same amount of scrutiny as, for instance, hard power does in the U.S. 
I think that's right. And I think uh, if there is, there actually is a bit in our book, which is not direct, but which suggests that I think that there is an intellectual who, if people had listened to him back in the late 1990s, would have profoundly reshaped the uh, history of the world. This is Eric Heliner. He is a uh, very polite and softly spoken Canadian political economist. And back in the 1990s, there was a big argument over globalization with people like Walter Riston, the CEO of Citibank, who is just a fascinating uh, intellectual as well as a, a businessman and somebody who really builds and shapes these systems. And Riston is more or less arguing that uh, the world that he and his fellow bankers are creating is a world in which financial flows are going to be impossible for government to control. So he is a libertarian. He's a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. This is for him the major political uh, victory that he is winning. And uh, Haliner politely points out in a debate that basically nobody pays attention to, that actually all of this money is flowing through a few financial centers, places like New York, places like London. And if the government ever wakes up and decides to do something about it, then uh, the government is going to be able to uh, take control. And so I think that if people had paid attention to this back in the late 1990s, along the lines that Elizabeth suggests, they would have realized that uh, these boring seeming systems, in fact, had profound political implications. And we would have seen a radically different form of globalization than the form that we have seen. So if there is a secret, I don't know, a secret alternative history, I think it begins with people paying attention to Eric Liner, uh, China, even the European Union looking at this and saying, actually, we don't want to go this way. And uh, that would have created a much, much less globalized world in which many of the uh, international systems that we rely upon to get money around the place to uh, for communications, for whatever, uh, this world would not be the uh, world that we live in today. The European Union examples in your book are so interesting because it really seems like it's a story of heartbreak for the EU. They're just sort of like going along and trusting that the US has their back and, you know, they have influence with the US and it's all great and good. And then there's this rift and they're just heartbroken. And the rift is, I think it's over Iran and and SWIFT, right? And and sanctions. The EU puts a, an actual law through the books saying if the US forces you as an, as a European bank to stop doing business with Iran, then that's illegal under, U, under EU law and you're not allowed to do it. And of course, this law has zero effect whatsoever and all of the banks stop doing business with Iran. It's, and it's interesting to me because post-World War II, you know, and you get into this, the, the, the whole idea of the EU is like transcending this military stuff and the, and the markets will be free and we'll all be friends and it'll be all wonderful. But then ultimately the U.S. can't resist using the power of, you know, finance and financial markets to, to, to do power. And they realize, oh, it's not this utopia we'd long hoped for, or dreamed for, like it all just goes another way. No, that's exactly right. I think if you look at uh, globalization, people rightly pay attention to the United States as being the major mover and pusher. But the uh, United States has always maintained the option of force behind this, whether this is military force or whether this is the kinds of economic coercion that we're talking about, whereas the European Union really bought into it in a much, much, much more visceral way. I think in part because the EU itself uh, is a creature of markets. And that's something that I think most US observers don't really realize, that the European project is really one of building markets and of breaking down barriers between different national markets. And so to live in a world which was a globalizing world where the world itself seemed to have the same logic as the EU, this was a very, very comfortable world for uh, European bureaucrats to live in. And I think they really forgot the uh, ways in which uh, power lies behind all of these arrangements. But to turn to Felix's point, I think if you have these laws in the book and you're completely unwilling to use them, then they don't have any deterrent force or deterrent capacity. So I think that uh, if we see God help us a uh, Trump administration coming in in 2024, the EU is suddenly going to have to get a lot more aggressive in the ways that it thinks about employing these powers. And uh, we are going to see a very, very different Europe than the one we have seen in the past. I wanted to just follow up on, on the Citibank thing, though, because that's really fascinating. Walter Risten, as you say, is this libertarian who's who sees the global financial system as it 
kind of sort of was pre 9 11 as being this like uh, anarchic flow of capital around the world that's that's out with the grasp of, of any government. But by the same token, Citibank itself is the most quasi-governmental organization I can think of. Like underneath him is this guy Bill Rhodes, who is jetting around the world, meeting with finance ministers. He like Citibank is the probably the single most important member of the London Club, which is the all the banks that lend money to to, to countries. Um, Citibank organizes the debt workouts for countries when the countries stop paying their loans and you get the 1980s you know debt crisis in latin america is citibank that's at the heart of this and that is basically insolvent as a result and it's you know the u.s treasury who comes in and rescues citibank by dint of this thing called the brady plan and you know and citibank shortly thereafter winds up buying the biggest bank in mexico which is called literally called banco nacional de mexico banamex and you know, and then gets into a whole bunch of trouble because they're fe- so close to the Mexican government. And like Citibank's whole sort of global ambitions for the best part of a century are intertwined with the way in which it successfully deals with governments around the world. And I think that on some level, Citibank wanted to be, you know, what the US government has become and what you know the NSA has become wanted to be that sort of powerful conduit between countries you know it was always one of the top two FX banks um, and and the way that now under its new CEO Jane Fraser it's basically divesting from basically the rest of the planet and it's just like yeah we're just going to be a sort of big bank in America kind of speaks to the way in which that vision has has evaporated. I think that is right. And I think for me, and again, Abe, who also has his own views on this, for me, the moment where the book really came together was when we discovered Walter Riston. Uh, We discovered him. And in a certain sense, he provides a wonderful example of how it is that the urge to try and liberate and the urge to control go hand in hand. So uh, I really think of this as being a sort of a, a tragedy of globalization in the classical Greek sense of the word tragedy, which is to say a a story in which characters are doing what they must, given who they are, and this leads pretty inevitably to some kind of disaster. And so Riston, in a sense, uh, these two sides of his character, the urge to control, the urge in a certain sense to turn Citibank into a kind of politics uh, that was not itself political, it it, it directly contradicts his uh, other urge, which is this urge to try and create this realm, uh, which is going to be decentralized. He has this great phrase that he thinks that centralization is a fascist state. And uh, this is, uh, and, and the two different urges, they twine together, they lead him to behave in ways in which effectively uh, the, uh, sort of the big dream that he has uh, contains the seeds of its own ruin. And you get other examples of this. I think that the other example uh, that we have today of somebody who tried more or less to pull a Walter Riston is Mark Zuckerberg. So uh, one of the uh, small parts of our story is talking about Zuckerberg and Facebook's ambitions to create a global currency, Libra or Diem, depending on which day of the week it was that you're talking about. And very, very clearly, this was a, we are going to create a equivalent of the US dollar. Uh, we are going to sort of try to create something which is a true global currency. So this was uh, an ambition which fed in from people like Peter Thiel, who had had very similar ambitions back in the early days of PayPal. They had wanted PayPal to be a dollar challenging thing. They had all read Neil Stevenson's science fiction books. And I thought, oh, my God, this is an awesome plan. Uh, As Thiel himself admitted, they didn't actually understand very well how currencies operated. But still, nonetheless, all you needed was a libertarian zeal and uh, the world could be yours. And Zuckerberg tries to do this again. And here, I think you have uh, this uh, combination of, on the one hand, this notion of how it is that Facebook can be a different kind of politics, which is much less coercive uh, than anything else. But on the other hand, you also have Zuckerberg being completely obsessed with Augustus, with uh, Roman history, and with this notion, I think, that uh, you know he could become himself a certain kind of indirect Caesar. So I think we have that very, very interesting 
interplay where business business wants to be free. Business wants to do its own thing. It does not like regulations or whatever, but business also wants to be centralized. Inside every lean, hungry entrepreneur, there is a bloated monopolist who is struggling to get out. And that bloated monopolist doesn't just want to make lots of money. That bloated mon- monopolist wants the world to come to them and to recognize their awesomeness and uh, their power and their majesty. And I think that that is a, uh, you know, that is one of the fun fundamental driving forces that I think help explain why it is, again, getting back to Binance, why why these sort of crypto companies, which again are pushing for a very radically decentralized world, end up creating these uh, points of centralization, which then allow government to come in and to uh, take control. So explain that to me. Why was Libra killed and Binance allowed to live? Because wouldn't wouldn't the obvious way to do this for the U.S. government would be to go, oh, it's Facebook. They're based in the United States. That you know, we already have a. Uh, all of our tentacles inside them. If they want to set up this global currency, all we need to do is throw a mirror inside Facebook and we get everything we want. Why would they be opposed to that? So China was convinced that this was all another grand US plot, that Facebook's Libra project was an effort by the United States to try and create its own or a new uh, global currency, which would be even more powerful than the dollar, which would uh, impose even more restrictions on what China could or could not do. They simply couldn't get the fact that this was nothing to do with the US government. This was Mark Zuckerberg with his own uh, particular imperial ambitions. Uh, and I think from the U.S. perspective, I think, and this is one of the things that I think uh, we probably don't deal with enough in the book, is the way that business sometimes itself does have a genuine degree of autonomy from the government. And if Facebook had managed to establish this as a kind of a global intermediary currency, uh, then this would have meant that government would have had to come begging to Mark Zuckerberg, perhaps, in the ways in which governments are having to come begging to to Elon Musk for uh, Starlink, uh, if you saw that New York Times piece about the ways in which Colin Kale and other uh, US officials, uh, senior officials of the Defense Department, basically had to pay court to, to uh, Elon Musk in order to get Starlink's access to uh, to, to Ukraine, uh, you would ha- you would perhaps have had similar dynamics happening. So I, th- I think I think that the reason that this uh, Facebook was very, very clearly and obviously a threat. It had a near global system already set up. It had the infrastructure uh, already put in place. If it added finance to this, there were a lot of things it could have done very straightforwardly and very easily. Whereas crypto, I think, has always been a much less uh, obviously threatening uh, force for uh, the United States. I think that the United States sees crypto as being a challenge as being something that makes it nervous. There are certainly people like Gensler who are extremely unhappy with crypto, but it is not seen as being something that is a true challenge to the power of the US dollar. And I think that people genuinely feared in the United States, in Europe, that uh, Facebook had the wherewithal to actually do something uh, which could actually um, sort of create a, a uh, semi-global system that would uh, be something that governments would not have nearly as much direct control over. A few years ago, when there were rumors that Zuckerberg was going to run for president, I remember talking to a friend of mine who sold a company to Facebook and asking him whether Zuckerberg was serious about that. And he said, uh, oh, no, Mark already thinks of himself as a singular nation state. Running for president would just be superfluous. Yeah. Do, do you think he still sort of has that kind of ambition for Facebook? This is a really good question, and I would say that uh, on the evidence that we see, uh, Zuckerberg is on the substantially less crazy end of the spectrum of Silicon Valley leaders <laughs> that we have at the moment, uh, which is uh, a very, very uh, sort of a, 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 a very ambiguous and backhanded <laughs> class of a compliment. I, I would imagine that he still has uh, overweening feelings of one sort or another. But uh, I think that he is uh, more in touch with reality than a lot of other Silicon Valley uh, founder CEOs from the evidence that we see. Uh, I do think that you know, the way that Facebook works, uh, the internal structures, the uh the, the, the amount of unique personal power that he has thanks to its internal governance arrangements are pretty extraordinary. So I think if I if I think of Facebook, I think of it as a kingdom, but as a kingdom that is in some degree of decline at the moment. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Schwab. You want control of your financial future? Schwab knows that. 
That's why when it comes to managing your wealth, Schwab gives you more choices. Like full service, wealth management and advice when you need it most. You can also invest on your own and trade on Think or Swim, Schwab's powerful, award-winning trading platform. Plus, you get low costs, transparent pricing, and 24-7 live help. Schwab understands it's your financial journey, and they believe you should have choices in how you invest. Visit schwab.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. I do want to get you right back into, into the core of your comfort zone, though, by coming back to Huawei. And the fundamental reason why the United States wanted to hobble this Chinese telco, and it comes and it goes back really to you know the very first chapter of your book, which talks about the way that the internet is a physical thing. It's a bunch of fiber wires. Um, all of those fiber wires um, tend to connect in a relatively small number of connecting points, often in Arlington, Virginia, and places like that where they can be spied on by the United States and, and used by the United States government for, for the exercise of power. You know, reading your book, basically the reason why the United States was so worried about Huawei was that they were worried that the fiber-based internet that gives America so much power right now would be replaced by a 5G internet that didn't involve any fiber at all. And if 5G was dominated by Huawei because Huawei had much cheaper 5G equipment than any of its Scandinavian rivals, then that would basically give all of the power that currently inheres in the United States to China. That's right. And I think that this is something, it was one of the reasons that the United States had much greater difficulty in persuading some of its allies, not all of its allies, about the threat of Huawei, is that the threat is a very, very difficult threat to explain without pointing to these effects of infrastructure and the way in which infrastructure can be a source of power, which is naturally a fairly uncomfortable thing for the United States to talk about directly. So there's, there was a lot of muttering about Huawei's ability to eavesdrop on the world. World, which is true, but uh, the United States, the NSA, almost certainly is able to penetrate Huawei systems pretty happily and can have just as much eavesdropping uh, power. Really, this is all about uh, who is in charge of the infrastructure, who is setting the rules by which that infrastructure is governed. And I think Huawei there, uh, it really was uh, threatening to become a major vector of influence for China, which China could use not simply to influence how 5G was implemented, but also could then use as a means to, for example, try to rewrite the uh, basic rules of the internet, the protocols that the internet runs on. There was a uh, big push by the uh, Chinese government and various Chinese firms a few years ago to create what was called so-called new IP, new internet protocol, which would be a more centralized form of internet communication, which would make it a rather easier for authoritarian countries to exercise the kinds of power, the kinds of influence over internet communications that they've wanted to do for a while. So I think that the fear that the United States had was that Huawei was going to be able to exercise its influence across a myriad of different aspects of infrastructure in order to provide China with the same kind of tentacular influence that the United States has been very, very happily able to exercise. And in fairness to the United States, I would 
far prefer with all of its problems, a world in which the United States is doing bad stuff than a world in which China is doing bad stuff, because the kinds of bad stuff that China can do is obviously going to be a lot worse than the uh, kinds of stuff that the United States uh, is willing to do. One of the things I was thinking about by the end of your book is just like, how far can the U.S., I mean, this is the big question, how far can the U.S. push this stuff? Because the core of the power of, of all this infrastructure is the boring aspect and the invisibleness of it. But it seems like, at least since Trump administration, and thanks to people like you, the stuff isn't invisible anymore. It's quite visible, and it pisses off other countries. And at some point, there's going to be backlash, and the, the power gets diminished. Like, this can't go on, right? I mean, systems break. The big event here is surely Snowden, right? Before Snowden, we didn't really know about any of this. After Snowden, there was like front page headlines in the New York Times and the Guardian and like, oh my God, like, look at how that wonderful word tentacular the United States has become. How much effect did Snowden have in making the, the invisible visible and changing public opinion or the ability of the United States to do stuff? It had a huge impact. And uh, we, for very broad values of we, have uh, data on this. So Yelling Tan, who is a colleague, uh, she is a professor. She's about to take up a major post at Oxford. Uh, She did some work, uh, more or less, going through Chinese government media using natural language processing to see how Chinese debate worked before and after the Snowden revelations, and also after the actions were taken against Huawei. And we see just as vast explosion of fear about U.S. power happening as a result of the Snowden revelations and a sudden shift in government. So we see a huge push after the Snowden revelations by China to try and figure out what are the ways in which it can insulate itself from this form of power that the United States has. This is really a story in which when we begin to see what is happening, it does have these consequences for politics and it does create these forms of pushback. And uh, to get to Emily's question... I really don't know what we're going to see over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. I suspect that we are not going to see any return to a global system of shared uh, infrastructure which people don't think about and which don't uh, where they don't see this as being uh, something which is political. So how that is going to shape out as our existing infrastructures age out and wear out and become less fit for purpose, I don't know. We are going to see some degree, at least, of uh, separation between uh, the uh, networks that uh, hold the world economy together. I don't think that we're going to see the full regionalization that some uh, people suggest, but we're going to see uh, a lot more messiness at the intersections. And I think we're going to see, uh, to some extent, people thinking about these networks in adverse serial ways. That is that they uh, want to make sure that when they are doing business with a part of the network that they are nervous about, that they have protections built in. And so that really is going to have some uh, transformative consequences, I think, for the global financial architecture. How those uh, consequences are going to play out, I do not know. But there's going to be a lot of mess, a lot of dispute, a lot, lot of disagreement. And some things that I think we take for granted are going to become much more difficult to do in the future than they have been in the past. So let's have a numbers round. Emily, do you have a number? I do have a number. Me have number. You have that number? Makes sense in a second. Me have number. It's two. Two dozen. Ooh. That is the number of cookies that are baked by puppet wrangler Laura McLean for Cookie Monster on Sesame Street. I know it's a very serious Slate Money episode, <laughs> but we need a little, we need to lighten things up. The New York Times has this wonderful story about the cookies that Cookie Monster eats in Sesame Street. And this woman, Laura McLean, who's been making them for years and years since the early 2000s. Um, and they're, they're not like real cookies, but they're somewhat edible. They're made of pancake mix puffed rice, grape nuts, and instant coffee and water. And the chocolate chips are from a glue gun. And the whole idea of the cookies is to make them very crumbly. So then when Cookie Monster puts them in his mouth, they crumble. And and this is like two dozen per episode? Yeah, two dozen per episode. It's it's very small batch. It's very artisanal. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And she makes them in her apartment. It's like not very high tech at all. Oh my god, she she should totally start monetizing that and selling like Cookie Monster no. cookies. No, it's pure. It's pure. The, the way it is is good. Yes, it's a it's a delightful article. Even after Sesame Street got sold to HBO, it's still pure. 
Yeah, it's still pure. It's good stuff. But don't try to eat the gluey pancake mixy. Unless you are Cookie Monster. <laughs> right. Um, Elizabeth, do you have a number? Uh, yeah, my number is 59 million, and that's dollars. And that was the amount paid for a wedding in Texas, or it took place in what? Paris, France. But what? there was a Texan couple who spent $59 million on their wedding, and it included an overnight stay at Versailles, because of course it did, and Rune 5 playing as the wedding band. <laughs> and the groom was just indicted for shooting at some cops and may end up spending 25 years in prison as a result. <laughs> I mean, this if this is actually a reason to have a blowout $59 million wedding, right? Because you want to get, you want to live life as m extravagantly as you can before you wind up spending 25 <laughs> years in prison. That would make sense. Million. How much do you have to pay Maroon 5? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's an astonishing amount of money for a a party for fifty nine million dollars, you could get someone better than Maroon Five. A lot surely. better, yeah, a lot. yeah, I would think so. <laughs> so there was mm -hmm. there was also a rehearsal dinner at the French capital's Opera House and a private lunch at the Chanel Haute Couture Suite. There, there's all this stuff they did while they were in tech, uh, Paris that I guess they just called people up and said, "How much do I have to pay to do this absurd thing?" The the Parisians saw them coming, man. I'm telling you, like the <laughs> Parisians. The Parisians are experts and have been for over a century at separating starry-eyed Americans from their money. Apparently, this is what's happened to the Cheval Blanc Hotel that has become overrun by like incredibly rich Americans, and it's not nearly as cool as it used to be. I mean, that's what happened to Manhattan. Felix, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Too many Americans. Too many Americans. They're everywhere, Overrun. I tell you. Well, they're not everywhere, but they're in Paris. This is the good thing about Paris. As long as you avoid Paris, you don't you don't encounter rich Americans when you travel around the world so much. Well, congrats to the happy couple. <laughs> My number is 15, which is the New York congestion price. The New York congestion toll in dollars. Um, we've been anticipating this announcement for some time and the question has always been like how much is new york city going to have to charge people to drive into manhattan in order to number one reduce congestion in manhattan and number two to raise a billion dollars per year which is the target amount of revenue that this is supposed to generate for the mta the, the transit system and a lot of people thought it would be 23 and it turns out that there was like pushback against the idea of charging $23 and it's going to be 15. And I honestly don't know if $15 is high enough to be able to do either of its stated goals. If it's high enough to be able to really bring down congestion or if it's high enough to be able to raise a billion dollars. So color me, you know, hopeful that it will work and I'm sure it'll make a difference at the margin. But I, I, I feel like with the inflation, People are just going to be, oh, 15 bucks. That's how much it costs to drive into Manhattan. And they're not going to change their behavior that much. It's roughly, it's the same as the tolls on the bridges. Like the George Washington Bridge is 1475. So it's sort of like what you, it's just what you pay to get to the city for drivers. So yeah. But then once they start charging 15, they could start moving up the price, right? It doesn't have to stay there. Yeah. That's what happened in London. They had to keep on raising the price in order to keep the effect on congestion the same because people get used to it. Right. So my number, my original number was going to be 24 trillion, which is the uh, number of security messages that Microsoft says that it receives every day. Uh, this was part of Microsoft's effort to uh, contribute to uh, Ukraine winning the uh, Ukraine-Russia war. There's a very, very interesting story about how Microsoft has become engaged in this. But uh, inspired by Emily, I've got another number, which is two. Two is the number of uh, optimal cookie mixes, according to Google. There is a wonderful Google paper. It's called Bayesian Optimization for a Better Dessert. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> something I heard from one of my machine learning colleagues yesterday. Uh, he told me about this paper, and of course, I had to look it up. And more or less what uh, Google did is it uh, tried to create an algorithmic means for discovering what were the best cookie mixes, uh, and it applied this both in its uh, Mountain View campus and in its pit 
Pittsburgh campus. And uh, so you would have um, sort of different people reporting back. Do they like, do they not like different mixes of cookies being applied in the same way that machine learning algorithms try to figure things out as a result of feedback. And they eventually came to two different optimal mixes for chocolate chip cookies, uh, which are the Google approved means of actually saying, if you want the perfect cookie, there are apparently two different versions of what that cookie would be. Why don't they just look at the back of the Toll House package where the best recipe <laughs> already exists? I don't, it's so overly complicated. I don't understand. I'm so confused. Because that's by not this. Bayesian enough for the, for the <laughs> Google oh folks. And th- this also gets to what Felix was saying. My favorite cookie uh, back of the recipe thing has always been the Pepperidge Farm cookies, which have these cookies which are like they would be made in your favorite European bakehouse, which for anybody who is actually European, the notion that there is a bakehouse <laughs> rather than a bakery is something that is going to yeah, make you that? break out in hives and spa. <laughs> <laughs> bakehouse, honestly. Okay, I think that's it for us this week. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Henry Farrell, for coming on. This has been illuminating, amazing, awesome, and brilliant. This is a ton of fun. Thank you. Thank you to Jared Downing for producing. Thank you all for sending in your comments and your questions and everything to slatemoney at slate.com. And we'll be back with more Slate Money. Hey, everybody. It's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.